Amen. Thank you, ladies. If you'll open your Bible this morning to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis 41. Going through the book of Genesis in our Sunday morning service, and we are coming, we've come to the life of Joseph, and we are, have been looking at his life for several Sundays now. And uh, up to this point in chapter 41 in Genesis, much difficulty has come to Joseph's life. I mean, he was minding his own business, no fault of his own. His brothers sold him into slavery, and here he is in Egypt, and no fault of his own, doing a good job. Somebody falsely accuses him, Potiphar's wife, and now he finds himself in jail and wants to get out of jail, and he is, doesn't belong there, and, and uh, he realizes that it's, these things are happening to him um, unjustly. He knows that. But he realized that God was doing something in his life as well, and God was doing something. At the time, he did not know it, but God was preparing him to be the second man in Egypt. And if he could have seen that, uh, that would not have been by faith, but he did not see that. God was preparing him to be the ruler in Egypt because troubled times were coming then. And today, we see the change take place. As we're reading in chapter 41, I want you to notice the drastic change that takes place in Joseph's life. This is the third time that dreams come in become very prominent in Joseph's life. And so here we have the dreams that take place from Pharaoh, and Joseph is going to be involved. Now we have a long reading today, so uh, there's, a reading for, there's a reason God has this whole story here. We want to um, look at this and understand and try to find out what God has for us. There's some lessons we can learn here, and I pray that God will point these out to us as we begin. We'll begin reading in chapter... 41 of Genesis, verse 1. And it came to pass, in the end of two full years, this is Joseph being in prison, that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And this is Pharaoh's dream. Behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine, or cows, and they were fat flesh, very plump, plump and good-looking cows, and they fed in a meadow. Behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ill-favored, lean-fleshed, and stood by the other cows upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed cows did eat up the seven ill, uh, well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke, it disturbed him. And he slept and dreamed a second time. Behold, seven ears of corn came upon one stalk, rank and good. Behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprang up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. It came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. You ever had a dream that bothered you um, before? I'm not talking about you ladies. You wake up and look at your husband with a snarl. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It was a dream. But, you know, you wake up and there's a, you had a disturbing dream of something happening. I was hoping that our young people didn't dream after the flame in the wind. We, it was, I realized it was not a kid's movie because <laughs> they dramatized some people that were being burned at the stake and I hope some of the kids didn't have bad dreams from that movie that we saw on Friday night. But Pharaoh was troubled over this dream and he sent and called all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof and Pharaoh told them his dream but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh and said I do remember my faults this day. Oh man I can't believe this. Pharaoh was wrought with his servants and put me in ward or in jail with the ca in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself, and must have paid the bills there or something. Anyway, he shaved and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. Whew, huge pressure on this guy. He's young. He's a young man. 
Look at Joseph's answer, verse 16. Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, and Pharaoh goes and tells him the very same dream that we just read. Let's pick this up in verse 20. Four. And thin ears devoured the seven good ears, and I told this unto the magicians, but they had, there was none that could declare it to me. Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. Both of these dreams have one meaning. God has showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. God has been merciful to you. He's getting ready to show you the future. Now, we would all like to know the future. You know, if we're going to make an investment in some kind of a stock, you know, we'd like to know the future. If you had a way in doing that, you'd be, you'd be doing well off. I mean, we'd all like to know the future for various things, medical issues. But God has a special reason for doing this. And he says, God has blessed you with this, to give you this dream. In verse 26, the seven good cows are seven years. The seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. The seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty years blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which the Lord has spoken to Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous." And for that dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. The reason why it happened twice is because it's not going to be something that's going to happen way out in the future. It's going to happen right now. Let Pharaoh do this. Verse 33. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part or 20% of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. When there's lots of plenty and there's just, I mean, plenty going everywhere, 20% is probably not a big deal. In fact, it would minimize the waste. Remember when you had a lot and you tended to be wasteful with that? <laughs> that happens when there's plenteous and we'll gather this together and we'll, we'll collect this and... And uh, it won't be a problem because there's such plenty. Verse 35, And let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn or grain under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. He brought them together and said, Hey, what do you think of this? Can you believe this? This is very interesting. And Pharaoh got together with his men and, and with his servants. And he, verse 38, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? I mean, if God revealed to you the dream, he's probably going to give you good insight into how to administer this. It makes sense to us. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house. According to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Remember now, 10 minutes earlier or 30 minutes earlier or not very long ago, this man was coming out of prison. Nobody listened to him. He's only 30 years old. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee ruler, or set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand. All of these things having to do with authority. I'm giving you my authority. Anybody has any questions? You can say, I am acting under the authority of Pharaoh. That's all you need. And he put it on Joseph's hand, and he arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck, made him to ride in the second... Um, Cadillac, I mean chariot, excuse me, which he had. He cried before him, bow the knee. I mean, if you don't know who this person is, because he's been in prison all this time, I'm going to tell you who he is. He's somebody that you need to bow to. And he had somebody running in advance of him wherever he went to tell them, move out of the way, move out of the way. Somebody very honored and respected is coming. Move out of the way, you need to bow to him. 
In verse 44, and Joseph said, or Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. That's even including Pharaoh's servants behind him. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah And he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out, or went out over all the land of Egypt. He went out to survey and see what needed to be done. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid, upon, laid up the food in the cities, the food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much till he left numbering, for it was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Manasseh means the sting is gone out of remembering his family. For God said he had made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, which means fruitful or blessed of God. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. From the very beginning of this chapter, in chapter 41, as we begin verse 1 to the end of where we, read, we ended today, verse 52, there was a drastic change that took place in Joseph's life. God was doing something. And God was doing a preparing work. And that preparing work is over what God was doing and getting ready to do with Joseph is now beginning. And there are things that we can learn from this story. Now we could learn the lesson during plenteous times. If you're doing well, you should save. You should put away things. And here's a good number, 20%. Nothing hard and fast about that, but a very good... You know, you ought to be saving all the time anyway. Just saving, saving. Then you need something that you take from that and go buy something and save, save, save. Just make that a habit. Good, good principle there. But there's other things. The overall picture of what Joseph was doing, what God was doing in Joseph's life. There's so much to learn in this. I want to just bring out one thing. Because I think in Joseph's life today, or Joseph's life that we read in our, our story today, we learn what God is doing. We learn that God is like this. This is the way God works. Joseph's life is like our life. This is a picture of our life. What God was doing to Joseph is what happens to us at times. Collectively at times, individually, yes. And I want to point out three things today that have to do with this this morning. First of all, God has a time of preparation in each of us. Joseph had a time when he was misunderstood. He was sold by his brethren. He's in a servant he was honored by his family, and now he's a servant in Egypt, sold completely away from his family. And then while he's there, he's misrepresented and, and finds himself in, in jail again. A servant now in prison. But God was doing a preparation work in him. God was preparing him. The bigger picture of this, as we understand, God was preparing Joseph to be able to save the messianic family because through Jacob was going to come the Messiah and they're going to need to come down and be fed. And so that's the bigger picture. But God was preparing him for this. Joseph did not know this. We have no record at all of God coming down and saying to Joseph, here's what I am doing in your life. Just be patient and hang on. He just knew God. And he knew what God was doing. And God has this preparation work in each of us. If you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, I want to read a verse of Scripture here. Because in Romans 8 verse 29, we have the Apostle Paul explaining what God is doing in your life. In Romans 8 verse 29, in fact, it says, This was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Do you know what God's doing in your life? He is conforming you to the image of His Son. There's a preparation work going on in your life right now if you are a believer. God is doing something in you. 
The word conformed to the image. The word conformed there has the word, is the idea of the word pounded. It's the idea of, it's, it's taken from the concept that the Apostle Paul would know in his day where they, they made coins. If you've ever been to Silver Dollar City in Branson, how many of you have been there? Let me see your hand. Silver Dollar City in Branson, we've, our family's enjoyed that, love to go at different times of the year. We've loved the quaint aspect of things, you know, people running around. My wife shot a black powder rifle for the first time in her life there. Boom! Right there. Whoa, that was exciting. We don't own one now, but uh, she, she, she shot that gun. and uh, We did a lot of things. We watched them mint a coin. They had this metal blank that they set on a little pedestal, and they had this large arm, this heavy arm that they swung, and it came down. Boom! And when it hit on it and they lifted it up, there was the imprint in that coin. And we could buy that coin. And we saw it made. This is how they made them in the Apostle Paul's day when he's writing the book of Romans. And he takes that imagery and he says, that's what God is doing in your life. He is wanting to stamp in you the image of Jesus Christ. So when you have difficulties and you're being pounded and you think things are going on, God is fulfilling His purpose. This was predetermined. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, He is doing this good work in you. In fact, the verse before says it's a good thing. We know that all things work together for good. What does that good mean? The good is referring to this process. It's not that you're going to be wealthy and happy and and healthy all of your life because that is good. The good is conforming to the image of Christ. That's what God sees. And that's what God is doing in us. He is conforming us to Jesus Christ. So to do that, He keeps pounding on us. And things happen in our life. Joseph is an example of God's preparing someone for something greater. God was doing this to Joseph. Absolutely nothing that he had done to deserve this. And God was doing this to him to get ready to use him for a great task. And God is doing that work in you as well. If you are a believer, you do not have to wonder whether God's doing this. He has committed to do this work in you. He is pounding on you. He's doing things in your life. So that you have the image of Christ stamped in you. So when somebody looks at you, they see the attitude of Christ. They see your actions. They see the, the actions of Christ. That's what God is doing in you. This is why the pounding. And Joseph is an example of this. Now if you're not a believer, God is to, working to convince you that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And He'll do different things to bring you to that point, to convince you of that. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, John tells us. To convince the world, to convict them, to convince them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. So we realize our condition before God. We are not all good and have this little spark of good in us. We have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have far fa fallen from that expectation that we were created for. No amount of works of righteousness can atone for this, can solve that problem, not by works of righteousness which we have done, the Scripture says. The good news, which is what the word gospel means, is that Jesus Christ came into this world to pay that debt of sin that we owed and to provide for us the righteousness that we needed. So that, that could be imputed or put into our bank account. So now we have the righteousness of Christ. So we stand in His righteousness, not our own. We don't go around saying, look at me, I do this, I do that, I go to church this much. No, we stand in the righteousness of Christ. And it can be yours today if you will simply receive personally what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. And make that a personal matter. He will save you. He will save whom, whoever. Whomever He will save. If you are a believer and you accept the Lord as your Savior, God has determined that the process for your life is to be pounded into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what He's doing in you. The second thing that I want to note is that that time 
of pounding will end. There will be an ending to this pounding going on in our lives. That is the good news. We read about it ending in Joseph's life. I mean, he steps out of prison. I think in his mind, he had no expectation and no anticipation of himself being in this position. I don't think that he, ever, that he did. I think he comes out and God wonderfully gives him this opportunity to share with Pharaoh what is going to happen. Here's what needs to happen, Pharaoh. Before I go back to prison, let me tell you what needs to happen to make sure this happens and take, is taken care of right. I think he would have as stunned as everyone maybe when they came back and said, God has revealed this to you and he's probably going to reveal to you the wisdom of how to manage this thing. We want you to be in charge of this. I, I think at 30 years old he probably was stunned at this. God had already worked in him. Any pride, all of this has worked out of his life. And God uses him. And as we read later, and we all know the end of this story, God used him to preserve the family of Israel down in Egypt. And the Messianic line continued. If you're back in chapter 41 of Genesis, verse 38, Pharaoh's servants, Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such an one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Now there's the Old Testament rendering of what we would say today being conformed to the image of Christ. This is the Old Testament wording. The Spirit of God's in him. I mean, the Spirit of God's in this person. It was obvious. Look at, look at this young man. People will notice when the image of God is stamped in you. They will notice a reaction that is different to situations. You react differently to situations at work when the boss says something to you that is not kind. You don't stomp out of there like other, other people. You know, I work for a jerk and everybody treats him like a jerk and he needs to be treated like it because he's a jerk. And everybody treats him a certain way. Wait a minute, I'm a Christian. I don't do that. I do something different. People will notice a difference in your life. This is not theoretical here. This is practical. People that did not even know God knew something was different about this guy, Joseph. When the image of Christ is stamped in you, people will know there's a difference in your life. You have a different attitude. You have a different walk. You look different. Two different times I think this, this difference or this turn event can, can take place. One can be in this life. God can do this in this life. He did it for Joseph. You can go along through life and all of a sudden you start seeing the blessings of God after waiting long years. And all of a sudden you start seeing the blessings of God. And you know it's of God. It is not your doing. It's God doing it. You didn't see it. And you see what God is doing. Wow. Wow. It can happen in this life. You can see answers to prayer after praying for years and long supplication to God. And all of a sudden now you see answers to prayer because you have been patient. And not impugning God because He did not answer your prayer immediately. You just kept praying and you kept praying. And you endured that time of preparation where God was, seemed like He was not even listening to your prayer. And you endured that and you kept praying and you were faithful. And all of a sudden now the blessing turns and God answers your prayer. Because you weren't impugning God. You kept believing and kept believing and kept praying. And God turns and answers your prayer. That happens. God can turn and save someone that you have been witnessing for, to and praying for for a long time. And God can turn and you can see all of a sudden that person come under conviction and get saved. And you prayed for them for a long time. My grandmother, I can remember praying as a little kid for my grandmother. We just prayed. It was like, now I lay me down to sleep, save grandma. You know, it's just they went to their prayers all the time. We prayed for my dad's mother to get saved. And after 30 years of praying, now I was a little, little fella, but I was in my 20s, or I was later, and yeah, I was, and my grandmother gets saved. You know what I kept praying after this? I kept praying, Lord, save Grandma. Now I realize, wait a minute, He did save her. I've been praying this so long. All my life growing up, we prayed God would save Grandma. 
And I kept praying for a little while. And I realized God has answered that prayer. I can't believe it. God has a time when He turns. There's a time of preparation in our lives. God is doing this working in us. And there's a time when it will turn. And it may be in this life when God will turn. Often God turns and allows His blessing to be on us in this life. Not so that you can boast in yourself. Not so that you can use this blessing to advance yourself in some fashion. Or so you can use some kind of, pursue some selfish pursuits of your own. No, no, no. If that is the case, you have not been stamped with the image of Christ. He's going to keep working on you. But God can bring a blessing in your life so that you use the blessing for His cause, for Him, for His purposes. God can do that work. And He will turn when you're ready and pour that blessing upon you so that you can be more useful to Him in this life. That has happened. God does that. Another thing that God is doing for you and for me right now, God is preparing believers to help rule and reign with Him for a thousand years during what the Bible calls a millennial kingdom. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6 says, And we shall reign with Him for a thousand years. Reign means we're going to rule. God is looking for presidents, for governors, for mayors during the thousand year millennial kingdom on the earth. God is looking for them. He is not looking for people that are going to be corrupt in administration. We've seen enough of that, have we not? He's not looking for that. Christ is looking for people. People say, well, this is a fantasy world. You're believing something out. I believe the Bible. I believe the Word of God. It says that Christ is coming back. He went away, and as He went away, He's coming back. And He's going to rule on this earth for a thousand years. And we're coming back to rule with Him. He needs governors. He needs mayors. He needs people to rule with Him. You know what he's doing now? He's preparing us and he's pounding us to get into the place where we will rule just like he wants us to rule. Not for ourselves, not for our advantage, but that during that time on the earth, we will rule the way he has administered rule being on the earth. Perfect government. So guess what he's doing in you now? He is preparing you now for that time. We can't see that. And some people die and leave this world having never seen the blessing that is going to come during that time. They have never seen the time turn from the preparation to the blessing in this life. They've never seen that. But it is coming. And what a grand and glorious privilege and blessing that is going to be to rule with Christ. Can you imagine that? I mean, you think about it. Think about that time of ruling and reigning with Him. So guess what God is doing now? He is pounding on you. He is molding you into the image of Christ so that you can rule on that day for Him. So God has a preparation time, but that preparation will end someday. The third thing that I have as a question to you and to me today is how are you dealing with the preparation? How are you dealing now with the preparation God is doing in you. Because He is doing something in you. The Bible says He is. The Bible says He has determined this long before that whoever trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior, He is going to work in them to conform them to the image of Christ. That is His plan. You have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. He is doing that work in you whether you see it or not. And Romans 8, 28 says that all things, all things, all things. And we know that all things work together for that good purpose. That's what God's doing. All things. You mean the, the pounding? The troubles? The difficulties? Yes. Yes. All things. All things. He's using those in you to conform Christ in you. Do you know Joseph never fought the preparation process of God working in him? He never fought that. If Joseph were here today, and we're, maybe, maybe some, some of you maybe were in the situation, Joseph, here's, here, here's might be your thing. Oh God, why am I here? Oh, I have never done this. Oh, why? You, oh, and we'd be whining and complaining, right? Look in my own heart sometimes and say, oh, wow. Oh. Joseph rebukes me. 
He did not know the end. He did not see what God was doing. He never complained about the process of preparing. Never complained about it. God was doing a work in him. At the very end, when he sees his brothers, you know the story he tells them. You might have meant this for harm, but God was doing this for good. He knew this all along. He knew God. God is doing something. He is preparing you. He is working in you. He's pounding on you to conform you. Let me ask you a question. What kind of metal are you? Are you soft metal that allows God to stamp His image in you? Are you hard and bitter metal? I'm not going to let God do anything in me. Whoa! Those people did me wrong. I'm going to stand up for my rights. I'm going to tell him what a jerk he is. You know what? I'm going to tell him. I mean, he did wrong, and I'm going to tell him. It's my place to straighten the world out. Wait a minute. God's pounding on you. He's pounding on you to get you to conform to the image of Christ. You need to be soft, metal, and let God do that work. D.L. Moody made the statement. He said, I believe that God has a school for obstinate people when they get out of this world. <laughs> I don't know if he's right or not. But he must have seen some people that were very obstinate too. They had problems in their life. I mean, we all have difficulties. But people react differently to difficulties. We have a difficulty and we say, what in the world? We storm around and get mad, kick the dog and throw things across the house. Or we can say, you know what? God's still doing that work in me. God is still working in me. And we accept that. Some people fight against God's preparation work. Let me say, when you do that, there's one word that describes that, and it's the word unbelief. The Bible calls this unbelief when you do not accept what God says. And how many times did our Lord chide his disciples? Oh, he says, he rebukes them for their unbelief. Unbelief, yes, it's not trusting God. Not believing what he says. Wait a minute. He has said in his word, he is doing this work in me. I don't understand this. I'm going to accept what he's doing. God's doing something. Lord, do that conforming work in me. May I be soft and pliable to your work in me. We're living like the unbelievers when we fight God. What difference is your life from an unbeliever when you fight the pounding in your life. What difference is it? That's what the unbelievers do. Don't they go and kick their tires of their car? Don't they kick their dog? Don't they slam the door? Don't they do these things when they... Don't, is that not the way people react when something does not go their way? How are we different than the unbeliever when we act this way because something does not go the way we thought it should go? We need to ask God to forgive us. We need to get on our face. and if We fought the pounding in our life. If you are accepting this and there are people that have gone through difficulties, we know about some of the difficulties and they accept these as from God. God is doing something. What faith that is. That is biblical faith. There are others that whine and complain and gripe at everybody and going to take everybody to court and sue them and bless everybody out and just let the whole world know how terrible they've been treated. That is not the response of Joseph. That is not the response of somebody who God is pounding on to... To make the image of Christ in. We need to ask God to forgive you for your unbelief and not trust Him. Confess it to Him. Time does not heal this. We need to confess it to Him and tell Him, I'm sorry for my unbelief. Please make me soft so that that work in me will take place. That should be our response. This is Joseph's response. Is that yours? If you've never trusted the Lord as your personal Savior, today's the day of salvation. God's doing things in you to convince you you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you are a believer, on the authority of the Word of God, God is working in your life to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. That's going to involve some pounding. How do you accept that? How do you accept that? Do you accept it in belief, in faith? Or do you fight God? in unbelief. If you do, would you confess that today to Him? Lord, forgive me for my unbelief. Help Thou mine unbelief. 
That's what God wants to hear. And then that work will continue on. Let's stand together this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you've given to us. Thank you for this wonderful story of Joseph. The lessons that we find in his life reiterated in our own. You're doing a work in all of us. Some it is financial, some it is relationship oriented, some it is through health issues. There are all kinds of ways that you're working in our lives to conform us to the image of your wonderful Son, Jesus Christ. That work will end someday and we will be useful to you in a greater, greater capacity. Until then, Lord, help us to be patient and trust you through the pounding process. May our faith blossom. People look at us and say there's something different about that person because we trust you. Would you do that work in us? Lord, if there's someone here and you've spoken to their heart, you know. You know the need. I don't know the situations, but you know. Would you cause them to respond in confession of unbelief and accepting you? If there's someone who's never trusted you as their Savior, Lord, would they trust you today? We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. 635 in our hymn book. We have what we call an invitation. It's a